I have uh, two questions. So first one is... Uh, please is, identify yourself. Oh, this is... Um, I am Min Sok. I go to school here. Um, and so it seems as uh, when it comes to exchanges, they seem to be consolidating. So if at some point, if, we, if this exchange uh, develops um, large enough, if, um, popular enough, do you think it will be all um, Kazakhstan government's interest to sell it to high speeder, or do you think it's, it makes more sense to keep it until the end of the day to keep as a strategic asset? That's uh -huh, the first uh -huh. question. Second question is, uh, when you were working as a governor, have you ever considered um, the monetary policy without the interest rate setting, uh, like MAS? And if you haven't considered it, uh, or if you consider it and if you decided not to go for that option, what uh, was the key reason, uh, especially in uh, like any non-strategic key reason? Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, uh, we'll take uh, one or two more questions, please. Uh, Asel, over here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Salvador Patron. I'm, uh, actually, I'm here as a banker, so uh, on, the, on the other side of the equation. Uh, my, my question is on, uh, I would add one more uh, to this uh, slide, and is actually on, on, on the human capital uh, and the mobility and accessibility of the place. Actually, from a, from a, as a banker, I welcome the idea of having another center, financial center, in between London and Asia. Um, and that, I think, is, is, is something that, that, that would be great and works well. That needs to be complemented, though, with accessibility and, and easy access for foreigners to be able to go in and out uh, and move people and capital efficiently, right? And on the back of law, um, uh, is the framework and things like that that are is a little bit more technical. Uh, obviously, that is a little bit more complicated and it's probably a longer sort of goal, but I was wondering if you're, uh, what, are, what are you doing on that front? Uh -huh. yeah, maybe so let's start from the exchange. Uh, what we have in mind and for, and, uh, for so first of all, the exchange uh, businesses should be profitable. And I know that many exchanges in the world now have uh, huge problems because uh, on some uh, exchanges, the equity markets is not so well developed. Some are uh, exchange is more focused on uh, fixed income. Before in Kazakhstan, we uh, we still we don't have a really kind of developed uh, capital markets. Uh, we have a, some uh, old stock exchange, which is more like a currency exchange in Kazakhstan. So right now we want to develop completely new one from scratch with a serious uh, um, global partner. Let's say we see that what's going on in, in the industry. You know that we, London is kind of have a transaction with. Uh, uh, Deutsche Bourse exchange and uh, many exchanges in the world are in kind of consolidation trend. And in these terms, uh, we're thinking that anyway, in a country should be kind of the regional hub uh, of, uh, in, a, in a region should be regional hub of the uh, capital markets or regional platform for providing the SME certain uh, uh, financing, so it should be, it, it, it have to be equity financing also beyond uh, just debt financing, which is already uh, developed in, in Kazakhstan. So uh, that's why we are quite open to all these, uh, we actually have a kind of two sites which we would like to attract uh, uh, to, uh, to us. So first of all, we are quite open to bring on certain, uh, let's say, uh, contribution, uh, on certain shares to the global uh, partners, like I mentioned, like NASDAQ or Japan Stock Exchange or uh, uh, Shanghai Stock Exchange. We even proposed to Singaporean Stock Exchange to do it, but they kind of uh, consider it yet, uh, this opportunity. So we, we are happy to sell it to the bigger partners, was your questions. Number two, we want to bring the financial investors. So it can be kind of the global asset managers, it can be global investment banks, it can be local development institutions, so we, we're looking forward to have a kind of a big panel of the stakeholders uh, in our stock exchange. But for us, it's most important that we have to have exchange trade platform. 
So we have in mind that, uh, that we will have also with some uh, junior mining platform. So in the region, uh, again, so there is no any kind of a really serious junior uh, uh, mining platform between London and Hong Kong, and I think in our part of the world. And I think uh, something like a Toronto Stock Exchange in the mining uh, needs to be created uh, in the Central Asia, because we have not only Kazakhstan, we have Uzbekistan, we have Mongolia, we have Russia, and this, uh, I think, will be uh, kind of interesting for development. In terms of the monetary policy, again, it was like a very uh, objective choice to move to more conventional monetary policy. So let's say it's like uh, it's a good uh, mood in, uh, in non-central banks to more to move to more clear and uh, rules and transparent uh, policy, uh, because to stay in the previous policy, we could not just kind of it was. Uh, a uh, big uh, uh, challenge uh, when we see that we now have a kind of not just uh, uh, mid-term shocks, but we have a shocks by shocks. And in order to absorb these shocks, we have to have new system. It was uh, uh, the only choice to move to the new new regime. It's, uh, it's, uh, I agree with you that as more economists we have in the, in this room, as more opinions about uh, which kind of the monetary policy or exchange rate policy with uh, having more benefits. So, um, but again, the statistics uh, told us that uh, the, let's say, top uh, 30 economies in the world, like 80% of them more based on exchange uh, inflation uh, targeting policy. One more non-strategic, uh, or even, so let's say, strategic uh, reason was for us when we all our neighborhood, uh, uh, the, the biggest trade partner of uh, Kazakhstan, Russia, moved to the same system. And in order to absorb the shocks and uh, absorb the particularly uh, potential volatility of the currency, of local, uh, of the currency in Russia, we have to have the, the more sophisticated system. This is what's the reason when we moved to mon new monetary policy. In terms of the uh, asset uh, management industry, so the idea of the localization of uh, uh, our uh, some uh, global asset managers who already help us to manage our money. I mentioned that we have a hundred billion dollars now, and have part, uh, 50 percent of them under the management of the global asset managers. And central banks already 15 years working with the global asset managers like uh, J.P. Morgan, UBS, Namura, uh, Deutsche, and many many others. Uh, we already have some uh, kind of secondments program of the employees of uh, uh, fellows of uh, Central Bank. But what we decided uh, to this moment is not enough. I mean, uh, there is no any kind of transfer to we know how, how to manage uh, world-class uh, industry, as, uh, um, asset management industry in Kazakhstan. So what we need is the people, uh, people in Kazakhstan who can be uh, global asset uh, members of the global asset uh, management teams. And in order to do it, we want to bring uh, some of these institutions on a partnership base. It, wasn't, it will not be kind of stick to stimulate. It's just partnership relationship for the more longer, uh, in, in a in exchange of the more longer term mandate to bring them, to establish their presence, to teach people of, uh, in Kazakhstan to, to manage with those money. At the same time, in parallel, I, like I mentioned, last 10, 15 years, we prepare many uh, people in Kazakhstan to be really kind of in this, to work on those institutions. So we have a, already 10, 15 years, many Kazakhs are working in a global investment banks, in asset management teams, in a big four institutions around the world. Mm -hmm. So what is now kind of people call agenda now? What we want is just invite people from Kazakhstan, people mm -hmm. from Central Asia, people from uh, Russia, Ukraine, Belarus uh, to work in a, in a center in, in Astana, like people like to walk in Singapore. So uh, in terms of easy access, what we decided for since January 1st next year, all the citizens of the countries which are part of OECD, and some countries like uh, Singapore and UAE and Monaco, they can come no, uh, uh, not having any visa for the 30 days in Kazakhstan. And if you will be participants of the financial center, or let's say will register at your financial center. For you and your family, we will provide five years long-term visa. And many, many other kind of small uh, details which we would like to simplify the labor uh, regime environment for the people who 
whom we want to bring to Astana with the idea Astana should be the kind of global international city in the near East region. Thank you. Uh, my name is Eric Hagen. I'm a student here of public policy. Uh, my question is, how are you developing regulations and the legal framework for new technologies like the local blockchain? Yes, these are, uh, uh, I think in, uh, every country in the world now divided uh, kind of for two camps. One camp is like uh, countries like uh, United States, UK, Singapore are actually very much keen to support wherever new uh, latest technologies can come. And, uh, and by the way, I think here we have a kind of uh, some uh, dilemma uh, which will be kind of very interesting to see what happens in the next uh, five, ten years. So from one side we have a kind of east coast of the United States where we have a very well established uh, banking uh, institutions with already like a two, three hundred years history with a huge lobby and with the idea kind of to be a a oligopoly or monopoly on certain kind of services to the people uh, in, in those countries. So let's call Wall Street community. Yeah. From the other side, we have a disruptive technologies community on the, on the uh, Silicon Valley, the people who create new businesses, uh, like who creates blockchains, uh, or the people who create digital wallets, uh, like uh, companies like Google or Alibaba in Asia, really kind of try to bring the same financial services or even extra packages uh, without any kind of the existing infrastructure. There is no, any, and it, people understand so that the banks uh, have to be changed. And it's kind of a, we will see what will happen. Frankly say all the previous startups movement and the disruptive technologies failed in terms of the real influence. So they've been ex uh, kind of implemented but not really changing the landscape. Right now we see it would be kind of a game changer or paradigm shifting. So we will see the, the, uh, the future very soon. I strongly believe that we, we will see the completely different the landscape of the uh, financial sector industries. From the other side, financial conducting authorities in Bank of England and the uh, monetary authorities of in Singapore are keen to support startups. So we, we know that there's already 300 startups here in Singapore we can kind of the every day change a picture completely. And from the other side, we have the other central banks who are just waiting when we, everything will stop, uh, will change. So <laughs> we are right now, uh, because we are doing from this scratch, we are in a position to be close to this agenda. Because we are creating the own regulation authorities, we, we want to be flexible enough to balance uh, the development, but at the same time to be the same prudent, respectable institutions like uh, central banks, which I already mentioned. Okay. Uh, lady here. Thank you very much. My name is Aziz Omarova. I'm um, working with UNDP Global Center for Public Service Excellence. Um, I would like to ask you, uh, we heard um, that there will be a plan to introduce common law system in the International Financial Center. That actually is quite commendable because basically that will create a um, quite unique system of the law in the former Soviet Union. By the way, I'm from Uzbekistan. So my question is, uh, what challenges would you foresee in introducing this in the continental system of legislation? And um, what potentially you would see as a phases of introducing this? Because it's supposedly the court system will be outside of the national court system of Kazakhstan. Um, supposedly there will be some collision with the constitutional framework. And supposedly you, you will have to hire uh, judges from the different uh, uh, jurisdictions. So these all actually put on your plate quite a heavy load of, of, yes. um, of work. So it would be great to hear from you, um, again, challenges, opportunities, and how would you see the phase approach? Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I would like just to explain that uh, in which particular phase we are now. Uh, you know uh, very well that we are in the same kind of uh, legal system, which is more based on the previous uh, Soviet Union, and like Soviet Union based more on the European continental law system. Uh, we decided to move to uh, principles of the English common law. Uh, so in order to deliver it, it, last year, December, the president signed up a constitutional law, which is allowed to, uh, a parliament approved, which is allowed uh, to implement the principles of common, uh, English common law in Kazakhstan. So what we have is like, we have a two, uh, two system. One is a local uh, 
kind of the local uh, legislation system where we have our own system of the uh, local court, supreme court and everything, and kind of the uh, local business practice. And we have uh, the other uh, constitutional law and these amendments to the constitutional legislation will allow us to have a kind of a one country and two systems. So very much kind of Hong Kong analysis to have one country, two systems. So we have a, the same uh, legal enclave uh, in Kazakhstan. Uh, so based on this constitutional law, in the next uh, 18 months, we, will, uh, we are now in a uh, kind of uh, uh, executing, uh, we, we start to execute plan to build completely new uh, legislation which would be based on the rule book of the uh, close to the UK uh, uh, jurisdictions, which will be based on the best practice in London, in Singapore, in, uh, in the United States. So we're now with the British Law Society working in the, under the new regulational rule books and all of this uh, new legislation which is, uh, would be ready till January 1st, 2018. So we now have a preparatory phase to prepare it and full-fledged system will be ready uh, uh, let's say the, the year to, uh, 2018. In terms of the in particular institutions, we will establish the, the same kind of the system which existed in London, uh, in, in Singapore, and was recently created in Dubai, in Abu Dhabi, in Qatar. So we will create the uh, independent uh, financial court, which will be completely independent from the Supreme Court of Kazakhstan. Uh, and we will create the arbitration and mediation center which will be also kind of part of the legal system. Uh, this, uh, on the very early stage, I think first 10 years, uh, we will see kind of more experts who are working over there because you need qualifi certain qualification to work, uh, to be a judge in a uh, system with a British uh, jurisdiction or to be arbitration uh, arbitrator. Uh, and uh, we are now working with, uh, again, a British Law Society with uh, former judges of the Supreme Court, uh, High uh, Court in the UK, and with the uh, uh, High Courts in Dubai and uh, Abu Dhabi, uh, with the idea to establish it. Again, the deadline which we have in mind is uh, January 1st, uh, 2018. So here is kind of, you write kind of uh, uh, two problems, which is kind of enforcement of this law if it will be collision from the local legislation. And here we have agreement with the Supreme Court of Kazakhstan that they will take uh, all the decision which would be mostly on the investors' uh, resolutions, uh, investors' disputes resolution, they take it in consideration and you have a full understanding with the government and court system in Kazakhstan. So this is a center of excellence. And if, for example, if you will not pay attention to the decision, which would make a sense to create it uh, right now. So here we have a full agenda that we in a parallel, we are improving the local system, but this center of excellence will be kind of the key priority attention of the court system and the investment authorities in Kazakhstan. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Harris Antonio from Amsterdam Trade Bank. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Very innovative thinking, forward thinking. Uh, one of the um, things that I wanted to ask, we have seen that in the development of financial centers across the world, a large part of the success has been based also on the ability to attract trade. And um, I wonder whether you thought that trade facilitation could also be part of what you call a financial center. We've seen that happening in Shanghai with the Shanghai Free Trade Zones. I suppose Singapore has implemented similar uh, policies. Um, is that part of the plan or yes. will it be? Could it be? Yeah, thank you very much for your question. It's uh, actually the uh, kind of niches for trade financing uh, instrument and infrastructure financing is a part of our uh, road match uh, which we would like to implement. Again, based on two uh, recent initiatives. One is uh, in terms of the infrastructure development and facilitation of the trade between regions, uh, which is one belt, one road. And we're working with uh, Chinese authorities, with uh, government of China, Silk Road Fund, with uh, multinational institution AIIB, that the Kazakhstan will be center of trade for the Central Asia, which will connect uh, Central Asia with uh, cities in China like Chunxin, uh, which is recently was also Singaporean government, was agreed to develop joint projects over there. And also 
uh, the kind of area around Chunsin with Central Asia and uh, also Eurasian Economic Union and uh, kind of opening market of Iran and further kind of the GCC region. And the number two is, uh, again, the uh, very big market of uh, Eurasian Economic uh, Union. And uh, what we agreed that uh, the financial regulation authorities for the, like, e let's say, ECB in the uh, European Union, uh, so kind of uh, regulation authorities of the Eurasian Union, uh, Economic Union would be based in Astana. So it means that we kind of, we will be kind of Frankfurt of uh, uh, this uh, part of the world which also kind of gave us opportunities for we facilitate some further, further trade. In fact, Kazakhstan is 50% of GDP of Central Asia already, and we want to be kind of the biggest trade hub. So if you kind of back to the geography, so we have in the south of Kazakhstan, dry port Korgos, which is uh, kind of the, before was bottleneck of the trade between Soviet Union and China, and now we create a huge uh, trade facility over there to connect the new floors from China. Uh, then uh, we built the railways from the east uh, till the west of Kazakhstan, which is the biggest uh, railways road construction last uh, 50 years maybe in this part of the world. It's more than 2,000 kilometers of the railways. It connected with border with Turkmenistan and further to with Iran. So this is, uh, and also have a project because uh, we are landlocked country, but we have access to the Caspian Sea. We have the Aktau Sea port, an expansion of the sea port connect Kazakhstan with the ports uh, in Russia, Astrakhan, in uh, Turkmenistan, in north ports in Iran, and ports in, uh, in Azerbaijan, which is called Baku. And from Baku, further Georgia, Turkey, we kind of have access to the European, Eastern European markets. So we have uh, such plans. It's not easy, but we have it in mind. Okay, well, we have time for two more questions. Excellency, uh, you, you must have... Uh, uh, Kai Hong, you might want to yeah, introduce I'm uh, Hua Kai Hong. I'm the, uh, a teacher of health and social policy here. Uh, but I'm quite aware of um, what has happened in Singapore when the MAS, the MAS first set up the GSIC in 1985, about 30 years ago. You know, there were two issues. One of the issues was the uh, benchmark on the returns of performance of the overseas, yeah. and, and you have, I think, pointed out quite well that you have access to a lot of the advisors and you're benchmarking it with performance of your assets management in your sovereign wealth fund. The other part that came about as a result of our investment overseas, when it was first set up, there was an estimate of what, $200 billion, but now we have gone, you know, uh, 30 years later. Uh, so the question of then who will be the check and balance on the um, external reserve led to the issue of the elected presidency you know, as, as uh, the person to provide the extra key. You know. uh, so I'm just wondering whether, uh, what are the plans in Kazakhstan yeah. regarding this? Yeah. Thank you. It's like actually my favorite questions and uh, because we are in discussion of these uh, questions uh, last, I think, five, seven years. So when we create the first uh, sovereign wealth fund, national fund, it was a very, very small size was less than, let's say, $1 billion. So, and the conception which was created to this was very conservative. So just to, to manage $1 billion, so you don't need JC uh, for this. And uh, when you have uh, more than $100 billion, you need JC. But we still have it uh, under uh, Kazakh MAS, let's say. And uh, the central bank is uh, kind of more, by nature, more conservative institutions. And it's kind of the government employees or quasi-government employees, they are not kind of the more focused on kind of on business and they don't have a kind of even institutional culture like of asset management, uh, asset managers have. And uh, we actually, this week we've, uh, we've met with uh, uh, GAC people and we have a kind of the same route with GAC uh, and you know it very well is uh, first we uh, ask uh, some uh, smart people, which is uh, the same people, by the way, Cambridge Associates, who are helping to the many sovereign wealth funds. Can you give us kind of the idea how we should manage this money? And so you know that we have a reserves of central bank and 65 billion national fund, which is also kind of we have a stabilization uh, part of this and savings part of this. 
But the rate of return so is very low, is less than 2%. And it's kind of the, uh, how to say it, uh, it's, uh, furthermore, we cannot uh, kind of be tolerant to this low rate of returns because it's already a law of big numbers. And it's became more and more unacceptable. And here is a kind of a dilemma between two approaches. So from one side, usually government bureaucrats wouldn't like to take, uh, are not really good risk takers. Uh, uh, but from the other side, uh, if you will kind of want to take a risk, for example, like Norwegian for the story, yeah, when the first times start to invest more to public equities rather than to fixed income, when they get the first uh, really positive uh, returns. But when it was a crisis in 2008, the first time realized that what is going on with losses. And because all the people in Norway, uh, Norway in this kind of very democratic system know that they, they've got the losses, who are responsible for the losses? What kind, who who uh, kind of accept these certain risks and certain investment declaration? People like returns, they don't like losses. And who should be responsible for this? Uh, central bank, by nature, responsible for the macroeconomic stability, not for the kind of the commercial side. So, and what we are now thinking that it should be kind of separate entity, we created in Kazakhstan two, three years ago, National Investment Corporation, small team of people inside kind of the uh, young uh, group of people who are study with Cambridge Associates, what is the kind of the latest uh, technologies on this? how to invest to alternatives, private equities, real estate, uh, hedge funds, funds of funds. It's completely different animal for the, for the uh, sovereign wealth fund. And we are now on the way how to kind of change the structure from the 80% fixed income to more proportional. Okay, even we don't need kind of very risky uh, strategy, it shouldn't be at least so conservative. So that's why I think uh, in the next uh, three years, uh, we will uh, finalize a discussion in the government. But here what is important, it should be, uh, right now is kind of a position the government or Ministry of Finance, which is account is under the management of central banks, telling, okay, I don't care how you are managing, this is your responsibility. And the central bank is telling, so these are the principles you accepted, so don't ask from me kind of the high rate of returns. And this is kind of the collective irresponsible behavior to my mind. <laughs> so we have to change, but the people in parliament should accept it and then didn't ask a questions when we will be kind of tough time in the markets. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, we've run out of time. We have to clear the room at 1.30. There's another World Bank uh, ASEAN Economic Forum coming here. But so please join me in thanking Governor Kairat for the very nice talk.